Welcome to the Legal 2 podcast, presented by LawyerLocate.ca. Join us as we explore the latest trends, strategies, and tools for promoting your legal practice in the digital age. Hosted by Mark Robbins, CEO of LawyerLocate.ca, Legal Tube, and Digital M Space, where we're all about legal marketing online for Canadian lawyers. Let's dive in. Hi, everybody. Welcome to podcast LegalTube.ca, the podcast, which is presented to you, to you by LawyerLocate.ca. Need a lawyer? LawyerLocate.ca. They've been working to make your legal connections for over 24 years. Today, I'm really, really jacked to let you know that our guest today is an old friend from many, many moons ago, uh, a lawyer extraordinaire from Toronto, the GTD area. Uh, Omar Howard I joins us today. Omar, how are you? I'm doing great, Mark. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's a real pleasure. So it's been a while since we've kind of caught up. Oh, you know what? I moved halfway across the country. You uh, decided to start a family, and so everything's changed. So let's catch up a little bit and share with the audience uh, what you're up to and and what direction you're going with your career. Yeah, so uh, I think you've summarized it already, Mark. I think, you know, family, uh, young children, uh, the important things for, I would say, uh, not just lawyers, but for everybody. And I think that's really been a big part of my focus in recent years. Uh, I've spent some time in uh, the uh, public sector as well. So work for government uh, and clinic uh, sector as well. And uh, in 2024, 2025, pivoting uh, in slightly different directions again after uh, those past few years of taking a break from the front. Terrific. So when I hearken back to our early days of knowing each other, if I, just to kind of put a bit of a timestamp on it, my recollection was I think I first met you at a uh, an OBA fundraiser that was Jay's that was in cooperation with Jay's Care, and I was also one of the sponsors. And I believe we met at Sky Dome uh, over a buffet that they gave us. And I think, if I remember correctly, my brother-in-law was there, and he was very much into lab work. And so you two kind of hit it off really well. And I didn't get to talk to you too much that time. But shortly thereafter, I started doing. Uh, the solo uh, shows for at OBA, and we had a booth, and I did sponsoring there. So we got to connect and I would always do what was, I stole this from a, a legal marketer in the States. Kevin O'Keefe was beer for bloggers uh, because blogging in those days was the thing. Not so much anymore. Uh, so, but back then, I, I use the expression, effectively, you were a bit of a media darling in, in the GTA when it came to getting legal opinions. And you, I recall seeing you on basically every network in uh, south, Southern Ontario, CBC, CTV, Global, City TV, and you do a lot of that stuff. Just a little bit, go back to those days, and how did you make that happen? Yeah, so Mark, I don't know if I necessarily made it happen. These are things that did happen. I did come from immediately prior to law, uh, a public relations background. So I did have some media background, some media training. Uh, as you mentioned, I did a lot of blogging back then, uh, legal blogging. So talking about cases, about policy. I wouldn't say, you know, things particularly controversial. They were it's sort of esoteric and niche, but it was not for the purpose, I would say, of trying to get media attention or trying to get clients. It's just, it was a way of connecting, quite frankly, with lawyers across Canada. And it was a great way for us, uh, especially when I was a law student, for me to get to know uh, lawyers who many of them became judges, some of them on the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, so you get to know people from just interacting with them because it's a way to actually engage with them on an intellectual level. And so that's how it started. And, and you're right, uh, Mark, for, for quite some time, I would do regular television interviews. Uh, right. And a big part of that is just the TV often wants someone who can speak with some credibility, who can take complex ideas, and the law can be complex, and to explain it in ways that I'm not going to say simple, because we're not simplifying it uh, or dumbing it down. That's not what it is at all. But to phrase things in a way that is easier for people to relate to their own experiences using vocabulary and terminology and communication that is familiar to them. 
I think that's probably uh, why I just ended up happening to be in the media circuit for a number of different uh, television shows. Nice. And I will tell you, uh, from my recollection, uh, every time you were on air, you did a fabulous job of doing just that. And it's funny that you mention it's not simplifying, but I use a different phrase because with lawyerlocate.ca, which is our parent company, uh, the legal referral service, uh, one of the things that Natalie Waddell, the founder, and she's an SEO, organic SEO expert, struggled with, with some lawyers, uh, in particular, some of our members, was doing keyword for the practice areas, and they would object. What Like one lawyer, an estate lawyer who you know, I'm not going to name him right now, you probably know very well, uh, he would, you know, he would send us these lists of keywords that were you'd have to have a master's or a doctorate in estate law to really understand what that was about. Yeah. And we we're trying to explain to him that the average client, I don't care if you're looking for a client that's, you know, six figure and above salary, they're not going to search these terms. They're yeah. going to search wills, estates, basic kind of language. It's the same for all categories. So we really struggled with that. And, and Natalie, to her credit, stood her ground and said, well, we're not going to use your fancy legal terms because it's not going to be effective and thereby I'm not doing you a service in promoting your practice on lawyerlocate.ca. So I find that interesting. To circle back to the media, so I'm going to say that was probably 20 years ago and they probably you probably ran with that for about another five or six years just guessing. But then something started to happen in North America. Uh, Canada in particular was mainstream media changed. I found my own personal opinion was I found we had less and less journalists in mainstream media. That's both print and television and radio. And we had more just op-ed and talking heads. And I think the public, I noticed, started to steer away. I mean, I was a big, have my six o'clock sit down after dinner and, and watch City Pulse. I, you know, I had to set my clock by that. I can tell you right now, I cannot remember the last time. I couldn't tell you last time I actually sat down and watched a six o'clock news on mainstream media. I don't. So what are your, you, you were in it in a different way. You've seen the change. What are your thoughts on what's happened to, to media, especially when it comes to impacting on a legal, you know, Canadian legal marketing professionals? How does, how does that change? Because you, like you say, you have a background in this area. What are your thoughts on that? Certainly, the media has changed. Uh, I think that a big part of the reason for that is convenience. So, you know, Mark, if, if dinner is running a little bit late and you need to start your evening news at 6.15, uh, you can do that now just, I guess, on your social media feed and you're not going to miss out. And so the convenience of being able to access information at your fingertip, certainly, so it's consumer driven, Certainly, I think, has uh, led to this transformation where people are looking for more of that information online. There certainly is streaming on demand. People do sometimes watch, I would say, maybe the evening news or a video. I watched a video this morning of, uh, that was produced by, I would say, a mainstream media company. So they're producing videos and they're using it in an embedded format in conjunction with an article. So I think media is certainly latching on to new media, or let's say traditional or historic media that we've had, and, and we have a bit of a hybrid. And then certainly we have uh, areas of the media today that are exclusively digital as well. So it's not very often, Mark, that I see a physical newspaper on Sunday. Uh, my, my elderly mother did bring me a physical newspaper and said, hey, if you want to read it. And I smiled and, and I looked through it. And I said, you know, mom, I have actually read all of these articles already online, right? I mean, as they came out, uh, I guess the day prior, uh, they're staggered and you have a chance to sort of read them. So uh, it is a different world. There is an advantage to being able to consume media in that way. But from a legal marketing perspective, certainly there's challenges then, because how do you understand this new ecosystem? It's not centralized, it's dispersed. And perhaps uh, most importantly, it is constantly changing. And so the conversations that we have today, Mark, as opposed to the conversations we would have had before, are also going to be inherent. Right. I agreed. And you know, you make a good point on that. Now, you, again, I keep going, dipping back into the past. I, I haven't fault me for not updating my, uh, my homework. 
you were for the longest time extremely active in social media. Actually, you were one of the people that uh, was in the forefront uh, for an Ontario lawyer because, as we all know, Ontario was one of the last provinces, the last sign of Upper Canada at the time, to allow advertising outside of Yellow Pages. And I know because it was around the same time that uh, Natalie started Lawyer Locate, so we had a bit of an uphill battle in educating lawyers that it was okay to advertise on our service online. But you were very active and you always seem to be able, and I know you're going to say you weren't always trying to, to get clients by using your social media, but the reality of social media, even back in those infancy days, was the whole, my belief was the objective was you had to be out there. You had to be a face. You had to be a voice people would be interested in following and hearing what you thought, whether it was legal opinions or just normal life stuff. Certainly, Mark, what I would say is uh, that is that is still true today, that clients and partners and uh, any type of other opportunities, people are always trying to get a sense of who you are as a person. Now, you may not get that uh, fully, obviously, in a blog post or an article that's written or for that matter, even a YouTube video or an interview, okay? But you do get some sense of person. Are they articulate? Are they insightful? Are they thoughtful and reflective in the conversations that they have with others? Um, and, and maybe not everybody is like that. Maybe not all lawyers are like that. But I do think there's, number one, a market for that. And number two, I think that that is perhaps the best way that I can describe the embodiment of our rules of professional conduct. Talking about the regulator and regulation here. Uh, I think that... You know, what I will say is that my involvement in social media at an early juncture in the legal community was also intended to help foster, uh, advance civil discourse and uh, professional communication. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of that has gone out the window. So I would actually say the argument for or the argument against social media is probably stronger today than it was back then. Uh, in the sense that it's it's really become a lot more unruly in the past few years, especially since the pandemic. But that might also just mean that there needs is a greater need for for strategy and uh, perhaps more precision in terms of how people are uh, having those types of discussions or having that. Yeah, it's interesting to make that point of, of how it's deteriorated. So to, let me try and bring in some of our experience in, in working with our clients and helping them to uh, handle their social media for their law firms, for individual lawyers. Um, one of the things that came up in the last five years was the advent of TikTok. And when I first saw it, and we were very active in social media with Lawyer Locate, Digital M Space, and obviously LegalTube. Um, when I first saw it, I went, oh, this, what is this nonsense? This is just kids. It's, it didn't make sense. And I took my time before I really started to take a good hard look at it. Once I did the kind of the penny dropped and I realized how powerful this little one minute to 90 second blurps could be to, and, and it addresses exactly what you're talking about, how to get to know the lawyer that you may or may not want to hire. TikTok is a freaking gold mine for that purpose from the side of lawyers marketing and from the side of clients looking. Conversely, the disaster that has become X, which I immediately removed, I, I still have our businesses there because I feel you have to maintain a presence, but my personal, I closed, shut down my accounts, grabbed all my data. I want nothing to do with it. I think that that's the epitome of a very sick social platform. That's get, it's not getting better. It's just not getting better at all. So, but we still, we tell all of our clients when we're managing their social media, you need to be on all platforms at some level. It's, it's important because people, not everybody will go to LinkedIn. Not everybody will go to Facebook. And a lot of the, you know, 20 to 40s are just attached to TikTok. You know, TikTok speaks to why I argued years ago with Kevin O'Keefe at LexBlog that I said blogging is dying. I said, and, and the example I used, I think I used this argument with you years after, I said, go to anybody's legal blog and look who's commenting. 90% of the time, the people commenting are other bloggers. So you're not, to me, if you're not getting comments from potential clients, that's what your, your purpose is, is to, you know, you're blogging to draw attention, then what are you doing? It, it becomes 
you know, my expression is a circle jerk. But I remember talking to Jeannie Dietrich and, and Danny Brown on the same subject. And both of them, they were recent guests of mine on podcasts, both agreed. They said, you're right. They said, we couldn't see that at the time. But I said, I know. And it's a sad state, Omar. Why is YouTube soon to be the number one search engine? Because nobody wants to read. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, Mark, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that people, it's not that they don't want to read. It's, again, going back to the convenience factor. And a short video clip is just so much more convenient to watch in our very busy lives than to sit down and read an entire article. That's what it comes down to. And so the, it's not just about one particular platform. I think that's part of what I'll move away from. It's more about the type of media. And so the type of interaction that we would look for before, we would talk about actually directly interacting with the public, okay, and having a voice as a member of the community. The way that we would, in our physical communities, we were members of the community online, try to add some civility to the discourse. Uh, I don't think that's the role of a lawyer today in modern social media. And so the short clips, whether it's on TikTok, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's on Facebook, uh, whether it's even on X, uh, people are uploading those also on X. And all of those platforms are using a newer format, short video clip, in order to drive engagement. That's what people want to see. Uh, and I include myself in that, especially when we're walking around with a handheld device, even if it's in our home, it is so much easier to watch something like that rather than when we sit down at our computers there's probably like work work that we have to do and we're focusing on something entirely different. trying not to have any social media on my physical computer makes perfect sense so and you, you open the door for us to take the next step so we're, we're sitting here looking at these short clips and and it's whether it's reels youtube shorts as you said TikTok, you know, facebook all of them they all not only have the short version, they push the short version. You know? So I'll use our own show. This show is an example. When this show is done and we've edited it and it's ready to go up, it'll go up in its long form on our YouTube channel. But then we will take it and we'll use an AI. And in particular, the AI we use will take this video and we'll use Opus AI. And this is a, an editing AI that I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but what it will do is it'll take this and you can cut it into 30 shorts and it will actually rank the shorts for you. Meaning from here, here's the one that's going to have the most powerful catch lines. It's going to have the most depth. So, and it gives you a percentage from 98 or 99 all the way down to the sixties. So you can determine how you want to utilize those clips. So, which leads me to, and as much as I'm going to say initially, I found this particular AI was a godsend. It took what would normally take us probably four or five hours. It did it in three minutes. And that includes posting it in a scheduled fashion. So AI is here. It's not going anywhere. I think we've all got past the, I know there was a lot of doom and gloom when AI first hit the world and everybody was panicking and all the deep by the way, is something I do still have a concern about is the deep fakes. And I was just interested to see what your thoughts were in, in the idea of how are these AI tools going to help or hurt uh, younger lawyers or old school lawyers, because it, you know they both have a different dynamic to market their practices today in Canada. Artificial intelligence is only going to hurt the lawyers who are not going to embrace it. That's what it comes down to. And so what I would say here is that in terms of the tools that you're describing, let's go back again in history. We talked about how blogging, for example, or social media was a very cost-effective and low-entry manner for small businesses, solo practitioners, small law firms to have a web presence. And in those early days, what we saw is that many of those small firms actually surpassed firms with much larger marketing budgets in terms of that online presence. And that online presence directly translated into firm growth. It attracted clients. Without question, we have seen that happen in the past. Where we are today is that 
everybody is using artificial intelligence. I would argue some of us on a daily basis, I'll include myself. And if we're not using those tools, we are also going to be left out from the new opportunities that are on the horizon. It is a new opportunity to uh, not necessarily have a web presence in of itself, but to have a web presence with cultivated media and also revolutionize the way that legal practice itself is done. Terrific. And this, the next step on this is uh, not about marketing, but we're now seeing AI for legal and ca with a Canadian flavor of basically, you know, here's your AI lawyer. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Here's what I would say. I would say that if you approach the lawyer today and the lawyer said, look, I'm happy to take your, your file on, okay, but uh, I do things the old school way. I am only going to go to a library. I am only going to look at physical books. That's what I know and that's what I believe in. Okay, that's my condition for taking you on your file. Uh, and yes, you're going to have to pay for that, the inefficiencies in that process. I think most clients today would say, but hold on, don't you have a database of some sort? Don't you have digital materials? Isn't there a quicker way that you can help me? And that's the paradigm that we're seeing today with artificial intelligence. Clients are looking for that value. They are looking for ways in which you can serve their needs, but do it in a cost-effective, more cost-effective way, more efficient way, and even a more accurate way through the use of artificial intelligence. I can give you some examples of where we're seeing that already. And I'm gonna give you four examples in particular, Mark, in increasing uh, levels of complexity. And the first one is that we're already seeing artificial intelligence in proofreading, typos, document management, uh, correcting errors, and we've been using it, all of us, for a long time. Think of autocorrect, okay? And yes, sometimes that autocorrect is a little bit annoying and it messes up those words, but maybe sometimes uh, in a good way, we shouldn't be using profanities, okay? Uh, so, you know, the autocorrect is really a rudimentary form of artificial intelligence. And so why wouldn't we want to have an even better spell check, I'll put it that way, that's going to cost us a lot less money or a lot less time, okay? Cost the client less money. The second main area that we're seeing is that they're actually reviewing documents. So we actually have complex legal documents, legal deals, uh, wills you've mentioned, contracts, even pleadings, okay? Uh, courts that are being used in court. And there's uh, a concept that's now developed in the past few years called technology-assisted review. And so I go back to this. There's still a lawyer in the pilot seat. The lawyer is still driving the car or the plane or whatever analogy you want to use, but that we're using the technology as opposed to saying, no, 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 I'm just going to walk. We're going to be able to go faster, farther, and be able to do a lot more. The third is automatic or automated legal research. Now, we're still seeing, as you know, legal hallucinations, these uh, instances where artificial intelligence is creating new precedents. But already, uh, we're seeing now in the, in the last quarter of 2024, some tools getting better and better and better at doing research. So we're talking about now, Mark, thousands and thousands of hours that we would have normally or historically spent on legal research can now be expedited. And that's an access to justice uh, win, okay? That's an ability to serve more clients and do it better. And then the last main area, which is really where we're seeing a lot of the concerted effort, is to look at more uh, risk-based analysis. And that's more complex. What is the risk? What are the uh, significant indicators of the risk? If it's a financial context, what are your specific dimensions and your sensitivities for what you consider to be risk in that context. Artificial intelligence is already making headway in those areas. And I suspect that it's going to be uh, the main driver for a lot of our legal work in the coming year. Okay, so let me ask you this, Omar. Let's take you back and say it's, uh, in January of 2025, you're getting your call. And what would you, in the climate that we live in now, from a legal marketing and exposure perspective, if you were a young lawyer getting your call in January of 2025, what advice would you give and tips to young professionals coming out on how to market their practices, whether it be a sole practitioner 
small boutique, which is the most popular form these days. The big firms are dying off, uh, which we predicted 20 years ago. <laughs> what, do, what would be your tips? Yeah, I think it's relevant for everybody, Mark, including the lawyers in the large firms. Uh, lawyers in large firms don't always stay in the large firms. They often end up in those boutiques or smaller firms or sole practitioners or move in-house, okay, uh, or move laterally to another firm. Even for those lawyers, they need to have some credibility. And the credibility uh, certainly comes from doing the legal work. You have to do the work. You actually have to practice the law. But this uh, notion about who you are is also now inevitably more informed through online content. That's just the reality. The, the era of the secretive lawyer who nobody knows about me and I don't even have a web page, look me up in the Law Society uh, directory and that's it, okay, uh, because I'm so exclusive. I think that era is, is over. Uh, and even the lawyers who, let's say, are the best in their niche, they're the most competent. If they're not able to uh, be known to a client who doesn't have as much background in terms of that particular type of legal service, they're not going to get the client. So it's a bit of both. And I think that's part of what we need to understand is that if we're doing it in an ethical way, we're doing it in a responsible way, uh, we're not, uh, I guess, uh, discarding those rules of professional conduct. And I think focusing on ed education, I think that's very much been what I've encouraged lawyers to do, is to focus on educational content. Conversational content is a good way to do education. Uh, that all of those types of discussions and content online really does help you in your career in terms of speaking opportunities, publications, uh, job opportunities, and as we've been talking about here, clients. Thanks, Laura. And, and you know, I just want to go back to my age-old debate. Blogging, vlo the old term was vlogging, if you remember that. We don't call it that now. Now we have podcasts. And we have YouTube. Um, I think, you know, my stand is going to be, if, if I'm advising a client, you're going to spend two hours of your day putting out media. Are you going to do blogging for two hours or are you going to do video content for two hours and you know what i'm going to say I, there's more bang for that buck on video than there ever will be today for blogging as far as attracting clients so mark uh you know me well enough to know that i never respond to a dichotomy but with either or but what i'm going to say is that in your scenario what i would do is spend about two minutes on chat gpt creating a post and then spend another two minutes creating an outline for a discussion or a show, also on ChatGPT, and then spend the remainder of that time actually creating uh, real live content that is genuine and people find interesting. And that would be on a video platform? I think video platform is certainly where it is right now. Right. Let's talk about this. Uh, uh, you said you wanted to talk about the artificial the artificial personas and the gravatars and the use of AI to, to let's say, have a person talking, okay? Uh, I think there's potential there. I think there's potential there, but there's a few shortcomings with those approaches to being online. We have a concept that's been around with us for decades. It's called the uncanny valley. So in Japanese, it was Bukimi no Tan. The reason why it's Japanese is because uh, a robotics professor in Japan, his name was Masahiro Mori, he introduced this concept back in 1970, which was that as much as we try to replicate something that's authentic, that's human-like, it's never quite there. Human beings have uh, what I would call little ticks, little fallacies, little imperfections that make us human. And that includes when we talk, when we have conversations, the way that we move. And so we have yet to perfectly replicate that. And that's the reason why when we see some of these artificially uh, and artificially generated videos uh, online, there's something weird about it. It's not really true. And sometimes that's fun, right? You get to see politicians, I guess, doing funny things. People do stuff like that or celebrities in different contexts, right? It's, it's fun. But we don't see it as being credible and authentic. And if your brand is about authenticity, then I think at this point, we still only have uh, the real live video of real human beings 
And uh, I don't know if we'll ever get to a point where artificial intelligence is actually able to replicate that type of authenticity. It's an interesting observation. I do agree with you 100%, by the way. And I would never, and we this has been a discussion with several of our clients and several of the, the clients that I we host and produce their podcasts and their live stream shows. And we've always said to them, when when the advent of AI came and, and the idea of having an avatar, and it was everybody's, oh, well, I got it. It's like, I kept going to the same place and said, the whole purpose of what you're doing is to introduce yourself to potential and prospective clients so that they see you. So when I designed the first uh, streaming show we did with LegalTube and Lawyer Locate was for a family law lawyer in Markham, who you know, uh, and, and it was called Ask Andrew. We created the show, we produced the show. One of the things that I strive to do, because he used to have a Rogers Cable show, and I just basically pitched him and I said, you, you don't want to be Rogers Cable. The public today wants to see your flaws. They want to see your fubs. I said, I will not, if I do the show, I will not edit out mistakes because the public wants that. Nobody wants to see a polished CBC interview show on YouTube anymore. It, it, it's boring. So all the shows we do, including this podcast, I will, I do it in a, a looser, there's no script, there's no real outlines. And the same with uh, Fire Away with Stuart Rudner's show monthly that we've, we're into our seventh year now believe it um you know and it's been the same and you know we've been very lucky with Stuart. he's he is actually a natural he does such a phenomenal job on that show hosting it but it comes back to what you're saying when you come back to the ai i i never have been and i haven't i've seen some really good ais that were deep fake ais that i really had to pay attention slow it down go back and forth a couple of times say okay no that really isn't clint talking Right. Or that really isn't Trump talking. This is something that's been created. That that's the part kind of cuts to my fear of if the, the technology's got to be very close to making it so I can be recreated and you can't tell if it's me or it's not me. That's a fear. And that's where maybe it, to round out this conversation, I'm going to come back to you and say, what do you think is the future? government responsibilities in the by way of laws to set some type of controls in place to protect us from deep fakes of yourself or of celebrities personalities and we still see we see celebrities hawking stuff that you know it's not that celebrity that it's fake i spend you know when i'm in the right mood i spend a lot of time on youtube reporting like i, I can't in my good conscience i can't let one go that i see i see and go this is a lie Get it off. Get it off. But what do, you, what do you think, back to your legal background, especially in Canada, where's the responsibility of the Canadian government or even the provincial governments to have a say on deep fakes? So we do have common law protections around the protection of our personality. You could also have uh, some privacy dimensions in terms of privacy torts uh, for appropriation of personality. But I think especially where it's being used for a commercial purpose. There may be existing law that allows for an individual who is being, let's say, spoofed through an online avatar to uh, be able to initiate civil proceedings if that person's making a profit. If they're not making a profit, it's probably not worth it. With celebrities, we actually have a tougher situation because by choosing to be a celebrity, and the question as to whether or not people actually choose to be a celebrity, um, they have put themselves in the public limelight in a very specific way. And I try to differentiate that. I think, for example, doing a media show, going on the news every once in a while and speaking about a particular topic like the law doesn't necessarily make you a celebrity in the same way as, you know, some of the, the politicians that you've described are actual celebrities. Um, and I think there's a distinction between the two. In fact, the law has, at least in Ontario uh, and in Canada, really emphasize the importance of a lawyer's reputation in defamation actions and the like. And so there is there is an importance in terms of retaining that reputation. And I think one of the best ways you retain that reputation is by retaining the ability to control your online appearance, how you present, even if it's artificially intelligent, generated through artificial intelligence. Awesome. So as we wrap things up over time flies, um, 
are we going to see uh, an, an Omar podcast soon that uh, we can start following? I don't think that that's in my future, Mark. I, I think my my media days in terms of being a trailblazer in that regard may, may be very much behind me. I think I'm looking for new trails to blaze. That's probably the best way to describe it. I'm not quite sure what that is yet, but I'm certainly working on and have been working on a number of cutting edge, uh, I guess, legal cutting edge is the best way to describe it, but also technologically cutting edge uh, developments and projects. Well, then, the, you know, you, you leave me with no alternative, but when you get closer to realizing some of these things, you got to come back and, and share it with our audience and we can talk some more about that. Like that would be really awesome. Subject to confidentiality. I think of this course. is where we still get, we, we get stuff. I'm about 95% of what I do, Mark, I'm not even allowed to talk about. So, uh, especially yeah. in this context. So it's nice to have a conversation about artificial intelligence and where things are going and a lot of esoteric uh, type of discussions because we don't get into the particulars of social client privilege. Uh, but I'm sure that we'll, I'm happy to have another conversation around something that is very focused and specific where we can make sure that we don't actually get into the particulars of things that I've actually worked on in that type of detail. Well, that would be great. We would look forward to having you back anytime, Omar. It's always a pleasure having you on and been a guest on some other shows that I produce. And, you know, like I said, you've always been a pleasure and the hosts have always been very grateful for your, the, you know, your content that you provide us and, and the way that you, uh, you share your experiences and your knowledge. So if anybody's trying to get a hold of you, uh, the easiest thing to do is to go to your LinkedIn profile uh, and we will uh, put that down the bottom at the end of the show. So you'll be able to, to get his information that way if you want to reach out to Omar for anything or just to say hello or let him know what you thought of the show. Uh, Omar, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. And maybe uh, sometime you might get on the big bird and come out west and see me in the, in the Rocky Mountains. That would be great. My pleasure, Mark. Good to see you again. And I do hope to see you, uh, if not online, in person at some point in this. That'd be awesome. So, folks, that's the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please help us out by liking the podcast and uh, subscribing to the show, either on YouTube or on our podcast. Our podcast is available uh, everywhere that you get a podcast from Apple to Podbean right through. So I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks for coming out. And that's it. That's all. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Legal Tube podcast. Ready to take your legal marketing to the next level? Our show delivers expert insights and practical advice to help you succeed in today's competitive legal landscape. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, this podcast is for you. For more information, check out lawyerlocate.ca. And if you have any questions, get in touch with us. Thanks for listening.